Hey, I'm Jaguar Wright Johnson. But I was born Jacqueline Suzette Wright at a John F. Kennedy Hospital in Stratford. That's how you pronounce it, Stratford, New Jersey. Um, I'm a complicated person. <laughs> and from 1977 to now, it's been a hell of a ride. Your parents, um, give me some back, from what, what you know, uh, as far as the back history on your father, mm -hmm. also the back history on your mother. You can start with your mother if you choose. No, no, okay. we'll start with dad. Let's, with Let's do the good news first. My father, God bless the dead, God rest his soul. Norman Lindsay Wright Sr. was uh, the middle child of nine born in Pitts, Georgia, to uh, David Wright Sr. and Georgia Ann Harden Wright, who were born slaves. Um, my grandfather was born in 1900. I think my grandmother was born in 1902. And they never liked each other. Um, they had nine, they had more than nine kids, but it was nine that survived the South. And um, my granddaddy was a song and dance man. Um, he was very popular on the Chitlin circuit, but he was married to a woman that he really didn't want to be with. And he was having a bunch of kids. I know my grandfather loved his family, but the truth is, is he loved his career more. Um, my Aunt Penny got sick with pneumonia. See, he used to open up for the Nicholas brothers, Fayette and, uh, um, ooh, ooh, what are the, oh, I'm trying to remember the Nicholas brothers' first names. The one that was married to Dorothy Dandridge and Fayette. And uh, my granddaddy used to open up for them on the Chitlin circuit, and he was so good that they guaranteed him a spot at the Cotton Club and um, Aunt Penny got sick with pneumonia and it was all hands on deck back then. A lot of people died from pneumonia um, back in the 40s, down south. You know, he's a sharecropper, but that's what he did to support the family, kind of. Um, but yeah, Aunt Penny got sick and he was late to Memphis. He was supposed to have been meeting the Nicholas brothers in Memphis. And um, he got there, and they had already left, and he missed his uh, he missed his spot at the Cotton Club, and um, he never let nobody forget it. That incident happened in 1940, something. I was born in 1977, and I heard about it all the way up until he died. In uh, 1986, my granddaddy was 86 when he passed away, so it was 1986. He died that fall, my Uncle Jello. He died um, earlier that year, it broke his heart. My Uncle Jello was his favorite. My dad was the hardest working and the most dedicated, but my Uncle Jello was his favorite. He was junior, you know. Um, yeah. He always wanted to make it. <laughs> Was there, <clears throat> from your grandfather <clears throat> to his kids, the nine other children, to your dad, was there any other musical outside of your grandfather? Everyone in my family is talented. If my father hadn't had such a great disdain for the music industry because of what it did to his family, because of the way my grandfather, I mean, you got to understand, my grandfather, he would get upset and be like, fuck all of you, I can't stand you. I was supposed to have went to the Cotton Club and married Lena Horn and left all y'all niggas in the South. Um, when I say him and my grandmother didn't like each other, they just, they didn't like each other. Uh, I remember uh, one day I was over, this is when we was living on the family, you know, the family house is on Spencer Street. Aunt Susie house, my Aunt Susie Bright, who was an executive at Campbell Soup all the way up until she retired, um, had the corner house, you know, and granddaddy sat out on the porch and grandmom 
up until she passed away. You know, I was a little girl. I couldn't have been, I must have been like three years old and I was playing in the living room. And I never asked myself why my grandmother was tied to the chair um, in the living room. I, I still don't know why I didn't think anything strange of it. It was just grandma was in the chair and she was tied up and I just accepted it. Um, and then my cousin Shermaine, who's my Aunt Verley daughter, God rest her soul, God bless the dead. Um, my cousin Shermaine, she, she had been living in Philadelphia. She had left Atlantic City and moved to West Philly with her husband, Rodney Gary. And so Shermaine came over and she saw grandma tied up in the chair. And she said, grandma, why are you in the chair? And she said, yo, aunts are terrible people. They tied me in this chair. I've been stuck here in this chair. And grandma just put on this. She was in such distress. And I still didn't have no question about it. I just was playing in the living room on the floor by myself. And so my cousin Shemaine looked at my grandmother and said, grandmother, do you want me to let you go? And she said, oh, please, grandbaby, just let me go. So my cousin Shemaine untied my grandmama and when she did, that's when we realized why she was tied in the chair. Uh, Cause she pushed my cousin to the side and then she pulled the knife out from underneath the seat cushion and she ran up the stairs to go kill my granddaddy and she was trying to kick in the door and he was laughing at her, he had the dead bone. Bitch, I ain't letting you in. <laughs> I'm a kid, you nigga. You know, like my granddad would do weird shit. Like we'd be having grace and during grace, he'd be like, Lord, can you please take this ugly bitch home? <laughs> you know, like at the dinner table. So I, I mean, love has always been complicated in my family, um, but they stayed married until they, till death do them part. My family don't really believe in divorce. So what was probably something that you may have seen your grandfather do to you, <clears throat> to your grandmother, just on your father's side. Oh, just, you know, cuss out all the time and they would cuss each other out. You know, my grandma go to the bathroom and then granddaddy got to go to the bathroom because you know they was up in age. And you know, granddaddy come, bitch, there's something cried up your ass and die, Jesus, die with it, die with it, you know. Or you hear them hacking and call, bitch, shut the fuck up, you know, that they just, they had an antagonistic relationship. Um, every now and then they try to kill each other, and you know. And as far as your father, um, what history? Is My grandma was a tall woman, see. My grandma, she was like the shortest of her siblings. She was six foot two and a half. My granddaddy was five foot nine. So I think he had kind of like a Napoleon complex and just wasn't going to let my grandma think because she was taller than him and bigger than him. I think, you know, that was kind of it. Grandma wasn't no joke, but he would never go too far because my grandmother's brothers were really big. And like my Uncle Tiny, my Uncle Tiny, he was eight feet tall. So, you know... What the hell was my granddaddy gonna do? Five foot nine, fucking around with Georgia Ann and tiny eight feet tall and come and pluck them, you know. So I mean it was a it was a mutual love, well hate, hate. They loved the family, they just couldn't stand each other. And uh, yeah. Where were they from, your grandfather? Pitch, Georgia. But you can't find it. It's not on the map anymore. Uh, the state of Georgia has disavowed all knowledge of the town. It was a lynch town, see. Um, white man came through, got offended that a black man could read better than him, and then he came back with his friends drunk, and they killed everybody, and my family escaped. Uh, made it to North Florida, and... Uh, Nobody talk about it. And we know it happened, and then uh, Georgia swept it under the rug, and it's still hidden under underpasses and stuff. They have it barricaded off. It you unless you knew where it was, you drive right by it, and 
they ain't pay no reparations for anybody from Pitch, Georgia either. They just swept it under the rug. So after that, my family went down to White Spring, Florida, and the last, the baby of the nine siblings, because there's only two left now, everybody else gone. And my aunt Teen, and then there's my aunt Iola in Chicago. Um, but my aunt Teen is still in the family town. I took my husband down there to go see her. I said, this is the closest you're going to get to me and my father, because she looked just like my dad. And that was my dad's favorite, his baby sister. Oh, my God. My dad would, he would rip down the Empire State Building for, for teen. Uh, but ain't, baby, ain't she great? She loved him. Oh, my God. The picture that they took at the IHOP when we went during the pandemic. She, ah, look at my baby. We talked to her, what was about a month ago? Because we got to go down to Florida, go see her. And uh, she's, where my, where my man? She loved her some Gerald. But, uh, yeah, so the family settled in Florida, and then, you know, everybody started migrating north around the 50s. So your father, um, what was his education level? What was his uh, occupation? He was forced to drop out of school in the third grade because he had to share crop. My granddaddy was so focused on his music career that he really didn't have time to work the land. And the truth is, is my granddaddy was a hustler. He'd rather go steal tires off the white people car and sell them um, than share crop. My daddy worked, so my dad had the mule and had the hoe, and he tended to about 15 acres by himself at nine years old. And um, my father was able to finish school uh, when he went into the military. Uh, my father signed up, went into the Marine Corps. He lied when he was 16. My grandma, you know, things weren't going as great as they were going with the land. There weren't enough hands working and my dad could only do but so much. So daddy went to the military so my grandma could get the check. And um, make up for what wasn't happening with sharecropping. And, and uh, my father's life changed. What branch did he serve in? How much time did he Marine serve? Marine Corps. Hoorah! Simple fire. How yeah. much time did he serve? Um, about three years. He was a scout sniper sergeant. He was also a cook in the mess hall. And when the colonel came through and tasted the food, he said, uh, this food is too good for, show, for soldiers who cooked it. And they said, right. He said, who made the gravy? And he said, he said, right did it. And he said, report to my quarters at, um, what's three o'clock, 1500 hour. And he went there and then they changed his assignment and that's how my dad got out of the field and he spent the rest of his time in the service as the private chef for the colonel. Um, but I mean, the worst had already happened by then. My father was a black troop. People look at Tuskegee and they think that's the only company that happened to. It happened to all the black companies. My father's company, they did psychological warfare testing and training. They had him in, a, in an insane asylum for 90 days, locked up, hypnosis, psychedelic drugs, had him doing all kinds of shit in there. My father didn't stop having the night terrors and blacking out until he was about 65. So when daddy had rough days, uh, it was just a rough day. We would come home, the house would be torn to smithereens, and we wouldn't know if we had been robbed or dad had a bad day, so we would have to sift through everything and see um, if anything was missing, and if nothing was missing, then we knew we didn't have to call the police, and we just had to clean up and have everything done before dad got home. Uh, yeah. How did your father uh Meet your mother. What was that? It was a blind date. My mother was a single mother of a complicated child that had been molested by a family member. My sister was six, Lachelle. She was six. She ain't like my dad. And then my grandfather died nine months after, well, nine months before I was born. So 
my granddaddy had pretty much raised my sister as the man of the house, and she gave my dad a hard time. She gave the whole fucking family a hard time. You know? When you say hard time, uh, the bitch is crazy. Uh, are there things you remember as a I remember everything. Can you elaborate on one of those times that you felt like this is just hard to deal with? One? Just one. Just Nigga. Don't make me pick. No, nah, it's all fucked up. She started putting pillows over my face when I was a baby. And she started setting me up to get beat. And she would lie on me, have the neighborhood bullies come after me to fight me, to scare me. I'll never forget the first time she got me set up to get beat up. I was five years old in Lawnside, New Jersey. On, we lived at 230 Haney Avenue. It was this fat bitch with a bad Jerry Crow named Rezzy. Therese. And everybody was so scared of her. Rez was about, Therese, Rezzy was about nine, I was five. And Rezzy was big and greasy. That Jericho shit was a mess. And uh, I think my sister had told her that I said I could beat her up. And so Rezzy came to my driveway. I was on my big wheel. And she stopped my big wheel while I was riding down the street. You think you can beat me up? I said, what you talking about? Leave me alone. I don't want to fight you. Well, you gonna fight me because your sister said. And I looked, and this bitch is standing at the door, and then she closed the door and locked the door. My sister, this bitch nine years fucking older than me. And my parents wasn't home. So I stood up, and I said, I don't wanna fight you, and then she pushed me. And she pushed me back, and all the kids, ooh, you know, all the kids on the block. And I just remember what my dad said. It don't matter if you win. It don't matter if you lose. But you got to fight regardless. So I balled up my fists, my little teeny skinny little arms, closed my eyes, and I just started fucking swinging. And next thing I know, I heard the kids, oh! And I opened my eyes, and Rezzy got a bloody nose. And she sit there and started crying me. And the neighborhood bully with the Jericho juice dripping ran up the street. And we became friends after that for a short while. We was decent. So as a reminder, you only have one other sibling? No. How many siblings do you have? I mean, does it really fucking matter? I'm the only child between my two parents. The rest of them niggas is half, and I really don't have much to do with them. How many have you? Well, there are biological children that my parents had before I was born, and then there were family members that were adopted and raised in the household. Everybody that I liked is dead. Everybody that I don't like is alive. For now, niggas is getting old. My brother Norman, he's been successful all of our lives. He don't like me because he don't like my mama. My sister Otelia don't like me because I ended up being our father's favorite. And Shelly just don't like me because I exist. And as long as I exist, I remind her how inferior she is as a human being, as a whole. Yeah. And what makes you the favorite? I remember you stated that you were supposed because to. Because I worked the hardest, because I listened, because I was obedient, and I treasured every word that came out of my parents' mouths. I honored my mother and father. I followed the Ten Commandments. 
beating in my head. I used to have to recite them. The whole chapter, Exodus 20, the whole chapter, every Shabbos when the sun was coming in, I had to know it by heart. And if I did, if I messed up a word, I'd get my ass whipped. I listened. Were there whoopings in your family? Oh, my God, yeah. This is, you know, this is the 70s, 80s. I preferred my dad because daddy was fast and quick justice. Mom liked to drag it out. You know, my mother unsupervised it. It wasn't good parenting. She would make us strip down naked and lay on our fa face down on the floor. And then she'd get a spray bottle and she'd spray us with water. And then she'd get the extension cord and beat the fuck out of us and laugh when we cried. I'll never forget, I had a Norman Bates moment. You remember the Bates Motel where he came in and he killed the bitch in the shower? Ah! My mama done me like that. I didn't wash the dishes, see. She ain't beat me like a normal person. She waited for me to get in the shower for my, sin, you know, for my skin to get soft. And she came in the bathroom and I seen her lurking and she pulled back the curtain and why, why, why? Stop beating the fuck out of me in that shower. I guess that's part of the reason why I never had a problem with scars. I've always had them. A body without scars, I don't understand. Yeah, my mom was, uh, she used to do mean shit. Like my sister, if she wouldn't wash the dishes and left the, the and the stink start to get stinky, stinky and the rag and then the dirty food and all of that, my mom made my sister eat that shit out the drain. And then made her wash down four tablespoons of castor oil behind it. Like my mom, her cruelty, with some extra shit. She got off on it. So like my sister, my mom used to love canned peaches. Oh, that was her treat. And my sister would steal my mom peaches. And then she would fill it up with water to try to get the markup so my mom would realize that she got the peaches with mommy. She got too much water in it then one day. So my mom got an idea. And she poured out all the peach juice, and then she replaced it with castor oil, a whole bottle of castor oil. And this, my mom, y'all just gonna have to forgive me, this fucking bitch, my motherfucking mama, sitting there waiting for Shelly to go into the kitchen and sneak to get the peaches. I told Shelly, Fazi, I leave them peaches alone today. Mind your business. I'm gonna just put some water in it. She ain't gonna know, all right. I told you. See, I've been telling niggas shit my whole life and they don't fucking believe me. So Shelly get in there, she go get the scooping and then she tastes the cast and my mom say, oh no, bitch. Have a bowl. <laughs> Eat them all. <laughs> oh my God, and then Shelly started shitting all over herself. It was terrible. My sister was always trifling. She stole my Jimmy, Bean, my, my Jimmy Dean when they first came out with the microwave biscuit. I worked hard. I did my chores. I worked for the janitorial company starting at the age of five. I was up at 4.30 in the morning working with my father at the buildings. we go have breakfast and then I'd have to go home, get dressed, turn around, get my bags, make sure my homework was all the way done, go to fucking school. That was my childhood. Go to school, do the school thing, leave, go back to the janitorial service, clean more buildings. We did medical offices. We was a medical cleaning company. Global was the name of the company. So see, I've always lived the LLC life. And then after that, and I had to come home do my homework, have dinner, and then make it to bed and all of that. Only time I really had alone was with the radio at night. And I'd listen to uh, Power 99, and then the quiet storm would come on and I could go to sleep. 
and then 4.30 in the morning, do it all over again. Mm -hmm. So who were some of your parents' musical influences that people that they might Oh, my mom loved everything from Motown and everything from Philly International. She a real Philly girl. My mom from down 23rd in Cambridge, she went to grads. She graduated from Kensington, but she went to grads. Um, it, she left when the boy had the gun in school and he was in the locker next to her, so then she transferred to Kensington, which used to be all white and now it's just all heroin addicts and shit. Yeah. Your father, um, did he have any musical like loves? Oh, my father played the guitar, he played the piano, and he sang better than anybody you ever heard in your life. When you hear me sing in my low register, that's actually how my father sound. So he not look up to anybody like having to do? Oh, my father loved. My father's two favorites, Nat King Cole and Ray Charles. Huh? George on my mind, my dad's favorite song. So how would you describe your overall adolescence? Nobody sang like my dad. When he was singing Larry Graham, One in a Million. You know, when somebody died or when there was a wedding, or it was my dad that always sang at the family function. And I'll never forget my Aunt Verley say, Wayne, gone now. I guess you're going to have to sing it, Jackie. You're the only one that can do it. Did your parents want you to sing? Like, were that something Hell no, my father didn't want me nowhere near the industry. He hated the industry. He hated what it did to my grandfather and what it in turn did to the family. My father did everything that he could do. He wouldn't even let me go to art school. He wanted me to be a corporate litigator. <laughs> At what point did he know you had the talent to say that? At what point did he know? I didn't. I never did. I still don't. I just am what I am. I started writing when I was 11. I started singing in jazz quartets when I was 12 for extra money in the summertime when I wasn't babysitting. Music saved me. It was my escape. My life was fucking terrible. So that's what I was gonna ask as far as, I, I do want you to try to categorize what, do you, what would you say your quote unquote family life was like? Chaotic. What My father was a brilliant man that married a woman in six months because she lied to him and told him she was pregnant and inconveniently had a miscarriage right after their honeymoon. <clears throat> It was chaotic. My sister was a child born out of wedlock and abandoned by her father who thought my mother was so crazy he didn't even want anything to do with his own, his own seed. She ran into him online a few years back. My mom and my aunt got involved and my mom started sending him letters talking about how she was glad he was back in my sister life and how they had so much catching up to do the nigga fucking deleted his Facebook the next day. That's how bad he ain't want to fuck with my mom. <laughs> he said, fuck that. That nigga deleted all his social media, wouldn't talk to my sister no more. I came on to my mom, you selfish as fuck. That's her father. You ain't supposed to be worried about that. Well, he, we have a child and grandchildren. That nigga don't want nothing to do with you. What was your mother's education level? What was her career? Like, what did she do? Um, my mother has two bachelor's degrees, one in regular education and one in special education, which goes to prove that anybody can get a college degree. What was her career? Uh, my mother was a school teacher. She teached in Camden, New Jersey, one of the worst school systems in the state of New Jersey. She teached in the roughest schools because they paid the most money and they really didn't care who they hired because my mother's a delusional schizophrenic. I don't know who the fuck would trust her with a classroom full of kids. <laughs> Other than Kansas fucking New Jersey. But thank you for the pension. Like everybody say, I've been living off of it for years. <laughs> my mom, her career ended at Broadway. She couldn't handle the classrooms anymore, so they kept dropping her down, and they gave her the kindergarten that last year. She lost them, the whole fucking class. <laughs> they went out for recess, and she lost the motherfucking class, the whole fucking class. 
Them little motherfuckers went down the street to the corner store. And <laughs> she's supposed to be washing them on the recess. She lost the fucking kids. I'm sitting there talking to her principal. Listen to me, your mother's gonna have to. We're gonna, I said, please, my father's dying. Just let her retire. We invested a lot into getting her this far. Please let her retire. Do not make us fight for her pension. And so that's when my mother retired and then my father died eight months later. And I've been taking care of my mom ever since. What was his ailment? Oh, I mean, my dad had 22 strokes. He had Parkinson's, bleeding on the brain at the end. He beat the prostate cancer, but the diabetes and the Parkinson's, see. Hardest thing in the world to do is watch my father lose his mind because he was one of the most brilliant motherfuckers I ever met. Only person smarter than my dad is my son. As far as... Um, God bless the dead. Did you have to move a lot as you were young or did you stay pretty much uh, stationary in one house? We right? moved until we got comfortable. My dad was an upwardly mobile Negro. They left Philadelphia, they moved to Jersey, to the suburbs, keep us out the city. But we was in the city every day because the cleaning business was in the city. So I was in Philadelphia every day no matter what. I literally grew up on both sides of the bridge, period. I was in the Northeast in the morning, in Logan, before school, then in Jersey, in private school, then back <laughs> to Philly. You know, so we was over the bridge at least twice a day, almost every day. So I grew up in both places. I just gravitated towards the hood. I liked double dutch. I liked sunflower seeds. I liked oatmeal pies. I liked, I liked dollar hoagies. I like boom boxes and the sound of the city. Jersey, it got quiet, too quiet. And everybody was more fucked up in the suburbs than most of the people in the city anyway. Suburb people so much more fucked up than city people. See, city people gotta deal with danger every day so they know how to avoid it. Suburb people, there is no danger so they always fucking looking for it because they bored as fuck. They're a lot more dangerous than city kids. I had more fucked up shit happen to me fucking with suburb motherfuckers than I ever did happen with city niggas. What kind of crimes did you see that kind of happening around the neighborhood? And you're like, and you're I mean, at, just ask me. So let's just say from age three to seven, did you witness? When I was three years old, I saw my first murder. I seen a man get a hole blown through him. Right from my face. Did you process it at that time? I mean, I've witnessed over 150 murders in my life, so I guess I processed it. How did it affect you, would you say, it's the first one? Learn the difference between life and death. I killed, a, I killed a bee, and I cried for days because I felt like a murderer. And I thought God was going to punish me and send me to hell. When you experience murder and death and as a child, it makes you innately in tune with the gravity of life and death. It was moving. It's no longer moving. And something made that happen. Yeah. As far as fun, what would you say were some fun things that you had a chance to do growing up? It wasn't a lot of fun. It wasn't a lot of fun. It was a lot of work and a lot of studying and a lot of time alone you got to realize the closest person to age proximity to me in my household was nine years. I grew up with grown people. 
I had a sister that was a grown woman when I was born. I was always alone. Did you witness any grown things? Of course I did. Did they try to protect you from that or no? Not really. My childhood was catch up or get left behind. Do you remember your first crush? Yeah. Little boy lived um, in Frankfurt, around the corner from Fifth House. He had a crush on me. He kissed me when I was seven years old. He was eight. And he was my boyfriend for a week. And then I broke up with him because I was waiting on Bobby Brown. I was gonna marry Bobby Brown. Whitney got him. Ain't that a bitch. I'm so glad she did, cause I couldn't have handled that nigga. What would you say was your first real relationship? Hmm. That's complicated. Walt. Walt. Walter Williams III in Williamstown, New Jersey. Around the corner from my Aunt Paulette house. I was 13. He was 23. He worked at the car dealership where my dad bought his Chrysler van and um, he slid me his phone number and we talked. Walt was sweet. He was in my life on and off about, till I was about 17. After that last time he went to jail for murder. <coughs> <coughs> I tried to stick by him on that case as best as I could, but he was going away for life. He, um, he did contracts. I didn't believe him when he first told me. And then one night he came to my parents' house. I snuck him in through the back. Let him use the shower downstairs. He was covered in blood. It was a job gone wrong. And he got arrested for it a year later. First degree murder for contract. He would ride his bike for 15 miles just so he could sleep next to me for an hour and a half. He made me feel so safe. His mama hated me. She thought I was going to get him arrested because I was so young. My eighth grade graduation, I was a valedictorian of my class. I had finished my eighth grade year in three months. They didn't elect me class president because I wasn't the most popular. So the only way I was going to be able to give a speech at my eighth grade graduation was if I was valedictorian. So I said, okay, I guess I'm just going to be valedictorian then. And they all laughed at me. And I just started taking my, um, textbooks home every weekend and I read them from cover to cover and uh, I completed all all the year's schoolwork before Christmas break so at that point in time I was only going to um, school for attendance and I would do um, peer tutoring and uh, I gave the speech as valedictorian <laughs> that day was special Walt was very proud of me I was about to turn 14, he was about to turn 24. There was nothing like it. My dad refused to let me ride with my classmates in a limousine to the graduation. They was all gonna go out to eat first and then ride 
in my whole class, because it was only eight of us that were graduating, was private school. So, yeah, now see, that brings up other memories. Fucking Bush Gardens in my eighth grade trip. That was terrible. My dad beat my ass in front of my whole class because he thought I had ran off with a boy that gave me his phone number. He couldn't find me. I was downstairs in the lobby talking to my mom. I called her collect. And when I came upstairs, he thought I had left with that boy from Bush Gardens. So he uh, pulled me into the room and he fucked me up. And he slammed the door so hard that it popped open so all my classmates saw. As my eighth grade trip. I worked hard. I raised, the, I raised $2,000 for my class to have that trip. I was a trip coordinator and valedictorian in my eighth grade class. That was a fucking uncomfortable ride home. Everybody fucking staring at me trying to figure out how I just took that ass whooping like that and I got a shiner and I'm just walking around normal. So anyway, my eighth grade graduation, um, my father never apologized about that. I waited a whole fucking month for the phone bill to come in so he could see the collect call from Virginia to New Jersey and say, I'm sorry, I fucked up. And he was like, well, you probably did something else wrong, so fuck it. See, I've been telling the truth all of my life and people haven't been believing me, even my own family. So my graduation, Walt really, um, Walt wanted to kill my dad so many times and I said, no. Nah. My mom won't know what to do without him. Let him be. Your parents knew of this relationship? Nah. I've always been good at keeping secrets. They had no idea. He was sleeping at our house four nights a week. I would sneak him in through the back. I would take the screen off after everybody went to sleep. He would come park his bike on the side of the car. He never drove a car. He always rode a bike. Park his bike on the side of the house, sneak around, jump over the fence, come through the back window, and then just come into the room. And then uh, he would have to be gone by 4 o'clock because Dad was up by no later than quarter to 5, so. <laughs> you had your own room. Yeah, I lived downstairs at the time, and they were upstairs, so. I never told anybody about that. I'm curious, how would you describe what your teachers would say, what kind of student you were? Difficult and brilliant. I've always been smarter than my teachers. I've always let them know it. Got suspended a lot because of it. My father always said, don't ever let nobody that's dumber than you think they smarter than you. So anyway, my eighth grade graduation, on the day of my graduation, my mom, she never asked me where I got my money from. I always had money. Walt always gave me money. Walt would give me like two stacks a month to get my hair done, go shop, and do whatever I want. So on my eighth grade graduation, because I was valedictorian, all these trucks just showed up at my house. Since I wasn't allowed to celebrate with the rest of my class and I had to ride with my parents and ride back home with my parents and I couldn't go out to dinner and I couldn't ride in the limo even though I raised the money to get the limo, um, Walt just, he just sent trucks. First came a truck with flowers. 
six dozen red, white, and purple roses. Six fucking dozen. Then came the truck and it was all of this candy and teddy bears and balloons. And then another car came and I had to sign for the package and it was a brand new Rolex. A lady's Rolex, my first Rolex. I was floored. I came back from getting my hair done and I had my layered stacks and my asymmetrical cut and, and my boyfriend showered me My father lost his mind. Beat the shit out of me right before I had to go to my graduation and took everything and gave it to his girlfriend. I got a typewriter as my graduation gift. Cause I was going to need it for boarding school. Did he send you to board school at all? Yeah, I, I had a full scholarship. I graduated valedictorian in my class. I had 10 scholarships. Best boarding schools on the East Coast. My dad picked the school. White, seven-day Adventist and Christian, and I didn't fit in. So I started running away with one of my roommates on the weekends, because it was up in North Jersey by the Delaware Water Gap, so we was only 45 minutes outside of Manhattan and a half an hour away from North, from Brick City, from Plainfield. And that's when I started getting into Islam. First, it was 5% Nation of Islam, and then I met Big L in Brick City, and we was creeping. But I started seeing Shia Muhammad, who's Dr. York, Dr. Malachi's York son. I'm trying to remember if he was in the 70s or the 90s. Either, either he was the 75th son or the 90 something son. But he was very important to his father. And I was promised to him. But that was after. I got pregnant before I got pregnant with my son. I never told my family about it until I was grown. I ran away from home. I gave birth to my daughter at the mosque and she was dead 13 weeks later and after she died, I went home. And then that's, I hooked up with L after that and then I, I got promised to Shia and What age was this as far as? Uh, 15, 14, 15 is. There was a lot that happened in that year. Cause I went to boarding school, I didn't fit in. I had a job, but I was a scholarship kid. I was smarter than everybody. The fucking Dean hated me at my dorm and she was a piece of fucking shit. She was married to a younger guy. Her father was on the board of the school and all they did was fuck all day and smoke weed and act like we couldn't smell it. And I just, I'm like, you an entitled little white bitch. This nepotism shit is going too fucking far. You, you're not fit to be the dorm mother for teenage girls. You act like one yourself. She didn't like me so much, so she started doctoring up my file and putting shit in my file that wasn't true about me. I had a friend of mine that worked in her office as her assistant, and she bumped into my file and saw the doctor and up my file saying I was doing all of this shit. She like staged all of these fucking events of shit that I didn't even fucking do. I could have probably handled it differently. The next day we had a dorm meeting. I wasn't speaking. 
she insisted that I speak. I told her, you don't want me to speak because you don't want to hear what I got to say about you. And she said, well, I'll just write I'll just write this in your file. I was like, like the rest of the fiction you wrote in my file? How do you know what's in your file? I said, bitch, because I broke into your fucking office and I read it last night. And she said, oh, well, I'm writing you up for that. I was like, you know what? Let me give you something to really write up. So I got up and I went into the bathroom and in the powder room in the lobby by the phone booths. This is at Garden State Academy, Seventh Day Adventist School. <laughs> you fucks. I went into that fucking bathroom and I ripped the motherfucking, um, <clears throat> the towel rack off the wall. And I came back out there in front of everybody and I beat the fuck out of her with that shit. I beat that fucking bitch until she bled out her fucking mouth, nose. She's bleeding out of fucking ear. Waka, waka, waka. They finally got me off her, and then all of us, I'm the devil! <laughs> She's a demon, she can't be in a Christian. Fuck y'all, I do Muslim anyway, bitch. So then I couldn't get into no other school because they thought that they was gonna press criminal charges against me. And so I lost my ninth grade year. They stole all my shit. They fucked up my clothes. They cut up my clothes. I mean, it was cool. I went home, and then I left home. I went back to New York. I went to Brooklyn. I was staying at the community at Bushwick and Flatbush. I ran away from home when I got tired. But, uh... Yeah, my ninth grade year was a wash, and then we had to figure out what school would take me because of my violent tendencies. And then I got raped by um, my sister fiance. In that situation, um, and it's touchy, but it's always, not say two sides of the story, but it's always a perception. I left home because me and my dad was arguing. He asked me, was I still talking to that murderer that buys me all the gifts? I'm so glad he never found that fucking Rolex. I ended up pointing that shit and keeping the money because I couldn't wear it. What did, what did, what? I only got 7500 for it. He paid twenty five. What did he do? Who? Walt? Yeah. He was a contract killer that was... for the Gambino family. Um, in the situation in which you were violated by technically, technically a family member, um... he made 20 stacks a job, and every time he did a job, he gave me five, five grand. During the course of our relationship, Walt Reader must have gave me about 150000 How fucked up is it when you're nine years older than your sister, you 14, and she fucking 23, and that bitch coming asking you to borrow money? I used to peel money off to my sister. At 13. That's how long I've been getting money. That my 20-something-year-old sister would come. You... You got like $300? Hold on, let me see. And you let your daughter do that surviving Tasha K shit? Fuck you, bitch. Because I paid for her too. I paid for all your fucking kids and your son, your fucking disrespect. Oh, I raised all your fucking kids, bitch, while you sat there and you fucking smoked crack and fucked everything. Let's do it like that. Uh. So anyway, me and my dad got into an argument. You still fucking with that killer? You still fucking with that? He could kill you. I wish he'd kill you. We duked it out. I got him up underneath his ribs. He got me in the jaw. I left. My father didn't beat me after a certain age. We just fist fought. 
I remember the first time my dad got scared of me. That was interesting. Because I wasn't going to stop fighting him back. I didn't give a fuck how hard he hit me. I was going to hit him back with every fucking thing I had. Fuck that. You going to respect me. So yeah, I went to my sister's house and she was stripping at some piece of shit bar in Frankfurt. Stripping and getting high. Her fiance, Jamie Wallace, was supposed to have been going to Atlanta with his cousins and his uncle and his brother for the weekend. So the apartment was supposed to have been empty except for when my sister was home. I needed some time alone. I, I could have called my friends. I could have hung out with my friends. I could have called my dude, Tweet. Tweet would have came and picked me up. We could have burned one. Like, I wanted to be alone. So I went to my sister's place because she was at work. And her boyfriend was supposed to have been in Atlanta for the weekend. I got there. I took the bus to 554. Got off at La Martinique Bowling Alley. The apartments was right across the street, Stratmere. She left the key under the mat. I went to the apartment. All I did was listen to music and smoke a joint and a couple of Lucy's that I bought. Ate a poor man meal, three chicken wings, rice and gravy. And I laid down on the couch. She called check on me, see if I made it in the house okay. I told her I was sleeping on the couch. She was like, no, you can lay down on the bed. Ain't nobody gonna be there. You ain't gotta sleep. I was like, no, that's you and Jamie bed. I don't need to sleep in your bed. I'll just lay here on the couch. I'll be fine. She said, ain't nobody. You ain't got no company. I was like, no, I just wanna be alone. And she said, just lay down on the bed. I'll wake you up when I get home and we'll have breakfast and we can talk about what happened with you and dad. So I laid on her bed. I didn't get under the covers. I didn't even take my clothes off. I only took my shoes off. I left my socks on everything. I went to sleep. And when I woke up, Jamie Wallace was on top of me. I was trying to get my bearings. You got to understand, I'm 14, 15 years old, about to turn 15. At that time, I was 104 pounds. I was only five foot three and a half. I was little. I, I was barely wearing a size B bra. I think I was like a B32. I was little. He climbed on top of me, pulled my pants down and rigged them around my ankles so I couldn't run. I knew you was going to feel like this. I knew you would feel better than your sister. You going to be the shit when you grow up. He's fucking saying this shit while he's raping me. I fought him off. I kicked him in the nuts. I got one of my feet loose. I ran out the crib. Half naked. Dragging my pants on one leg. Before I got to the door to get to the street, I pulled my pants up. And I ran to White Horse Pike, Route 30. Wasn't no bus in sight. So I just ran. I was on the track team. I was real fast when I was young. I must have ran three and a half miles until I finally caught up with a bus. I got on the bus and took the bus, got off, taunting in White Horse Pike in Berlin. It's a dark road, about two miles to the crib. And all I did was repeat the Lord's Prayer over and over, and I walked all the way home. I got in the house, went in my parents' room. And my mom was on the phone gossiping. I told her I had to talk to her. I didn't quite know how to tell her what had happened to me. Me and my mother never talked about we had never had 
the mother daughter sex talk. <laughs> and she was such a fucking prude. I, how the fuck do you explain what just happened? And I said, Mom, he done terrible things to me. He a fucking monster. Shelly can't marry him. I got to call my sister. She can't fucking marry him. And my mom said, well, she's pregnant. I said, yeah, he's a fucking rapist. She can't marry him. He's a monster. Well, I don't know if I would tell her if I was you. Well, why not? Well, women don't like hearing bad things about their men. That was the first time I realized how fucked up in the head my mother was. I said, well, I need to go to the hospital. I need to call the police. Oh, no, you can't do that. If you do that, your father will just... No, he'll kill Jamie, and, and, and Shelly has to get married. She's pregnant out of wedlock again. She has to get married. I said, he's a fucking monster. I'm like, okay, I can't get ready. I can't get through to you. Call my sister. My sister got home from the club. I made my mom take me in the middle of the night back to the apartment. Shelly got into the car. I told her everything that happened exactly as it happened. How I could have that conversation with very easily because that was the person that I talked to about life shit. What a mistake. Because that bitch ain't got no good advice for no fucking body. So after I tell her everything and say, you cannot marry him, you cannot marry him, that motherfucker's evil. And she looked at me and said, well, I'm just going to have to talk to him and see what he got to say about it. So fuck you mean? I'm telling you what the fuck he done to me. Yeah, well, we just going to have to see what he got to say. And that's why I was like, all right, I'm going home. Good luck with that. Her and my mom got together. They worked the story. I was jealous that she was getting married because I didn't have no boyfriend. I'm fucking one of the greatest rappers ever fucking lived in the world. And they fucking ain't know it. But I'm jealous. I'm a crackhead rapist. I'm fucking Lamont Coleman on the side. Promise to Dr. York's son in the front. And I'm jealous of a crackhead fucking rapist that rapes little girls? That's what they told my father. Told my father if I came to him talking about this shit that I made it all up because I was jealous and not to believe me. That's what my mother and my sister did to me after I was raped. I, um, I contracted the clap and crabs and gonorrhea. I wasn't allowed to go to the hospital. I wasn't allowed to talk to the police. My god brother, Keon, took me to Planned Parenthood down in CDC, South Philly, on Broad Street, so I could be treated for VD and pregnancy get my HIV test. I went through all that by my fucking self and my family and helped me with shit. And three months later, I had to sing at that motherfucking wedding. I had to sing the Lord's Prayer and watch my father walk my sister down the aisle to the pussy that had just raped me. And this bitch fucking Jamie, piece of shit, fucking South Philly task, a project, piece of shit, motherfucker sitting there smiling with a shit-eating fucking grin. He wasn't smiling because he was happy to get married. He was smiling because he knew in that moment that he'd gotten away with murder and he was never going to go to jail for what he'd done to me. Fuck you, Jamie. I hope you catch something they can't cure. Well, maybe somebody rape you the way you raped me. Maybe I ought to pay somebody to do it. Maybe I finally fucking feel better. I've been gang raped by fucking worse than you, bitch. And you're the only rape that haunts me. I guess because you're still breathing because the rest of them pussies ain't. Don't nobody get to touch me for free. And you ain't dead yet. You owe me! You owe me fucking flesh, bitch! And fuck my fucking sister. I told her until she fucking publicly acknowledged what they done to me, she can't call herself my sister ever again.
fuck you and your motherfucking kids that you had with that rapist, bitch. I don't give no fuck if our mom was raped and all our aunts was raped and if incest was fucking normal. It wasn't ever normal to me! I can't, I can't. Uh, this is all before you're 18, so I don't want to end with anything before. I hadn't even got pregnant with Giovanni yet. What, what, when, how old were you when that happened? When I was 15. After the rape, after the wedding, I left home again. And I didn't come back until I was five months pregnant. See, my sister and her husband, after they got married, moved back home with my parents. Because he's about to go to prison for that credit card scam that they did. And uh, they, my sister, she turned state's evidence, and he took, a, he took a deal. So they pretty much stayed at my parents' house up until right before he went away. They got a little railroad apartment down Hamilton. And then he went to jail. But I didn't come home until I was pregnant and showing because I figured that would be the only way he wouldn't touch me. So, so I, I got pregnant to protect myself. Giovanni's father. Yeah, Donnie. Donnie. Was that a relationship? No, he was my choreographer for my girl group, Philly's Blunt. Black Ladies United in Truth. <laughs> that was my first group. We was going to be TLC, but it was six of us, and we could all dance, we could all rap, and I was the lead vocalist. He goes, Donne is what he calls us up, but his name is Donald Boykins. Please record your message. When you've finished recording, you may hang up or press one for more options. Donnie, they, they filming me talking about my life story. Um, and we're getting to the section where I got pregnant with Giovanni. So if there's anything you don't want me to talk about, you need to um, hit me back and let me know. I know we haven't talked since 2018. I know, I know, I'm fucking terrible. But I, I don't want to... Um, I don't want to. I don't. I don't want to paint you in a bad light. So just uh, let me know what you don't want me to say. All right, bye. If you're satisfied with the message, press one. To listen to, to send your message with normal delivery, press one. To send your message with urgent delivery, press two. Thank you. Your message has been sent. Before we get to that part, <clears throat> there's been a lot of, you know, with the music where, you know, you're creating, but there was also a lot of destruction that was happening around you, um, or I'm assuming, um, let's say, you know, as you're getting to your teenage years, um, did you have any close, either friends, family members that you lost? My cousins and my aunts. When I ran away, I would usually go live with them unless I went to New York. And when I was in New York, I was either down 117th and 2nd with my dude who I used to hustle um, Coke and chocolate tie with. His mom told everybody I was her daughter, so nobody questioned why I was in the neighborhood. Or I stay out Brooklyn, out Flatbush. Um, 
But if I was in the city, I would either be with my cousin Mark or I'd be at my Aunt Frida's down southwest Philly or I'd be at my Aunt Belinda's up uh, Logan. Mm, 4800 block of Marshall Street, 5th and Loudon, UNLV. Or well, I was down the projects with my Aunt Dot down uh, Richard Allen. Did you have any close people that passed away or didn't make it early on in your life? Oh, God. Yeah, that, that's a long list. By the time I was 19, I had been to over 150 funerals of just my friends. And I sang at two thirds of those funerals. The worst was when they murdered Sutan. And who was he with you? Nigga from the neighborhood. He was a hustler. We, you know, neighborhood dude, Al Logan. Sutan was so cool. Shit. <laughs> See, Sutan liked to get money, and I like to get money. So I always had, like, mad respect for him. He got caught up in some shit. They cut him down, hunting in park. Broad daylight in front of everybody. They shot him like 50 times. And then there was my ex dude, Anthony, who lived up Cayuga, 15th and Cayuga on the other side of Broad Street. He hustled on my side, Logan side, UNLV side. And um, there was that day. Me and Aunt had just really started seeing each other. He was a hustler. He called me short. Everybody, you know, that's back when everybody was saying, yo, shorty, yo, shorty. He always had to be special. He got rid of the E, just short, yo, short. <laughs> I was short. He came over every day after school. After I got home from school, because I was going to William Penn, he would meet me at Broad and Alany or meet me at Broad and Loud and stop and take me get something to eat. And we go to my aunt's house or we go to his mom's house where he lived and kick it, smoke, whatever. Me and his mom was cool. Um, I don't know if Anthony's still alive. I hope he is. I hope he got better. Anthony was at my crib all day. I played hooky. Danny was doing a deal with them niggas over on, um, oh, what street was that? Like 11th and Loudon, basically. No, what's the hawking? What's the hawking? They was fucking with some Puerto Rican niggas from the, from the Badlands. They was doing some business with them. Danny was always real cocky. He was on some, I'm gonna take your girl shit all the time. Fucked around with the wrong Puerto Rican niggas. Fucked around with the wrong chick. Little did they know them niggas had been following them all day. Anthony at my house, we laid up eating beef and broccoli, watching um, old episodes of Martin and shit. And I'll never forget when Danny came pick him up. And it was Danny driving, and then the other two young bulls was, that they hustled with was in the back seat. Aunt kissed me, jumped into the car. I had to go to Jersey because I was under court-ordered mandatory um, psychiatric treatment because I had a break, and I beat this girl up real bad. I, I, I beat her in her face with a brick. I snapped. I, 
So I had to go to Jersey every Thursday to meet with my psychiatrist. And um, he was like, call me as soon as you get to Jersey. I might come down here tonight. And I'm like, cool. And so I got on the train. I took the train. I got off at Camden. My mom picked me up, took me to my therapist's office. I went back to my family house in Berlin to sleep. And then I was going to take the train to go to school first thing in the morning. Back to Philly. I called Anthony. I called his mom's house. His sister picked up the phone. And she was like, short? Short, is that you? I'm like, yeah, where Anthony at? I'm you know, I finished my homework or whatever. I wanted to see if he was still coming to Jersey tonight because my boy got a party and yada, yada, yada. And she was like, it ain't going nowhere. I said, what you mean he ain't going nowhere? She was like, he in the hospital. I'm like, what do you mean he in the hospital? Where he at? She was like, he down Temple. He down Temple in the ICU. I'm like, what the fuck you mean he in the ICU? <sighs> So that's when his sister tell me that six blocks away after leaving my aunt's house at 4803 Marshall Street, the Puerto Rican niggas followed Danny and them down to the block. They pulled up alongside of them, ran up Desert Eagle pump guns. The two niggas in the back seat, they blew the, both of their heads off. The one dude they had the windows up because it was still winter time. So they put, they put the, the pump guns on the windows. They shot through the window. It spun the one bullet. The one charge took, it, it took Danny whole knee. So his leg ended up having to be amputated. Um, but he was able to drive to Temple with the left leg. They tried to blow Anthony head off, but he had put his hand up. So when they shot, it instantly blew the middle finger and the pointer finger off. And it twisted the blast enough. So instead of going into his head and his head exploding, it just took off like this piece of his head and his brain was exposed. And that um, happened six blocks away after he kissed me goodbye, told me my kind of jersey. So um, I got the bus schedule. I knew the head of the ICU unit because it was my boo tweet. It was his mom, his mom, Roger Shade, my Miss Betty, Betty Shade. She was the head of the neuro intensive care unit. So I was able to get in, even though I was technically not family, to go see him. My cousin Donald, God rest his soul, he died during the pandemic. 2020. Um, Donald came with me, and when we, we walked into the room, and Aunt was, you know, he had the shit down his throat, and, it, and um, his they had stapled what they could staple together to cover the brain because the skull was gone there, and. Um, and uh, he, he was, his hand was bandaged up because the two fingers was missing. And he, but his thumb was real black, so it had already started dying. And I, I went into the hospital and I, I grabbed his hand and I, 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 and I said, Andy, it's me, it's short. And then he, he kind of snapped awake and he started grabbing. <laughs> And then the machines was going off and Miss Betty had to rush us out and my cousin was just crying. He was like, yo, Annie fucked up, yo, Annie fucked and them niggas came to our crib and Annie survived. He was in the hospital. The other two was dead on arrival because both of their heads got blown out. They had to amputate Danny leg. Um and they had to put a plate. Well, I mean and Danny leg and Anthony had to get the plate. But they didn't put it in right away because the blood clots kept forming on his brain, so they had to just staple it. Cause they had to go. Um... So yeah, I, I was in the hospital with him every day. Um, Temple Hospital 
They brought in Allegheny, which is a major stop on the Orange Line. And I went to school at William Penn, which is abroad in Girard, which was a major stop. So I could catch the express train, get on at Girard, and then the next stop was, you know, Allegheny. And so I was there every day. I'd go to school, leave school, go to McDonald's, get him a quarter pound of meal, two apple pies, and um, a chocolate shake. And I was sneaking into the hospital because he hated hospital food. And the McDonald's was right there at the corner of Broad and Gerard. It was perfect. So, um, and I would come and I would do my homework and sit with him. And then I found out other bitches was sitting with him. And then I came in one day and then Miss Betty was like, um, have you been coming up here having sex with him? And I'm like, fuck no, I ain't having sex with him in no hospital. He's, he's got half a brain. Like, I, he got to recover. She said, well, child, and who gave him the clap? And I'm what the fuck you mean he got the clap? This nigga had other fucking booty bitches from the neighborhood coming down there fucking him during the day while I was in school and then get rid of them out of the hospital. So he getting pussy, pussy, pussy. He fucking caught the clap. You got half a fucking brain, but your dicks just. Anyway, we broke up after he got home. He finally came home. He wasn't right. He just, he wasn't right. And uh, one day we was laying in his bed and we was smoking an L. And I was high as shit. And he started rubbing me with his hand. But see, that thumb died. So all of this was gone. And all he had was the ring finger and the pinky finger. And the rest of the hand was gone. So he's sitting there rubbing me with the two fingers, you know, and he's trying to caress me. And I've been an asshole my whole life. I'm just real honest. I said, nigga, you feel like fucking Captain Hook. Get that shit the fuck off me. <laughs> he's like, you a fucking bitch. I'm like, you fucking cripple. <laughs> we was just a real North Philly relationship. And then we went to the McDonald's one day, and he had a seizure in the McDonald's. And I got him home. He had messed all over himself. He had dropped his food and you know, all of that with the. And he was like, I'm fucked up, short. I ain't, I ain't no good. And your life just getting started. Don't come around here no more. And I'm like, fuck you talking about? I nursed you all the way through the hospital. You cheated on me. You got the fucking clack. You scared me half to death. You got piece of brain. You got piece of hand. I've been here all this shit. And you breaking up with me? And he looked at me. He said, sure. I'm out. I'm out the game. All I'm going to do is hold you back. Don't come back here no more. I got dressed and I left, and I never saw Anthony again. I, I never drove past his mother house. Like, even when I was driving around the city, I avoided his block so I would never run into him. I don't know if Annie's still alive. But if you are, I'm sorry. I'm still mad at you for getting the clap in the hospital. So I have to ask y'all. Were you not, did you have any fear in you back then as far as, you know, the drug game, the violence that was going on around uh, in, your, in your neighborhood in Jersey? I understood that violence. It had rules. It had structure. My home life didn't have no rules. Didn't have no structure. I'd rather be fucked over by a stranger than be fucked over by my family. Because if, at least if it's a stranger, I won't feel bad about shooting you because you're a stranger. I might think twice if you're my family. It was just easier that way. Did you see yourself ever being like, involved in a life of crime? I know the I'm a criminal. I've learned how to be a law-abiding citizen. 
Make you no mistake. I am a fucking criminal. I'm just good at being a criminal. I can't complain about any of the time I've spent in jail in my adult life. The truth is, if I had got caught doing any of the shit that I really did, I'd still be in jail now. So I can't be mad at a couple months in the county and I ain't got no penitentiary number when I, ch I should be doing 25 to life. Did the police know you by name? The feds know me by name. Fuck the cops. Ain't nothing but fucking security guards. So on the creation part, the music, you saved say, my life. Who were you, you? You said there was a band that was put together, or a group. Of girls. Yeah, my group, Philly's Blunt. What was that? Me and my cousins and my girlfriends from my block, Black Ladies Unite, Philly's Blunt. This was when Blunts was very big. We was gonna be bigger than TLC because there was more of us, and I could sing. There was six girls in the group, so we had double what TLC had. So the routines, the choreography, dope as fuck. But then everybody got boyfriends and started getting pregnant. What were the ages of um, that was Everybody in the group was between the age of 13 to 15. And we had a manager, and I got us booked for our first talent show. And then that get, got me a gig singing backgrounds for a girl from Southwest Philly. I can't remember her name now. She lived down um, 47th and, um, in Baltimore. I was at 47th and Woodland, so I would have to go over her house and do the choreography. That's where I met my baby daddy. He was doing choreography for her, too. And um, we did a Teen Summit. I was her, one of her backup dancers for Teen Summit. Yeah. And then she, um, she got fucked over by Hak Islam, and nobody ever heard from her again. Hak Islam fucked her over so he could manage Maya. And Drew Hill. And then we being, being love bitches who he got all of them pregnant. He got the whole fucking group pregnant. How the fuck you the manager and you get every bitch in the group pregnant? We must be in. We must be in love. You remember that song? Yup. I can't slime fucked all them bitches. Got them all pregnant. How old is he? I don't fucking know. He old as fuck now. He was old as dirt then. Hawk was in his 40s back then. That was in the early 90s, so Hawk should be like damn near 70. Dirty bitch. I'm so glad my ain't gave you no pussy. You was trying to fuck her too hot. <laughs> Your dirty fucking pedophile ass. But I do know that you fuck Cisco. Hawk. Nobody's safe. Nobody's safe. What you think I ain't know? Maya told everybody you was fucking Cisco. <laughs> it's Sigma Cell. Everybody tells Mike Tarsia everything. Because everybody gets high with Mike Tarsia. <laughs> First time I seen Grace Jones fucking ass, ball, pussy, naked was with Mike Tarsia. Because she only sing in the booth naked. That's the only way Grace Jones can record. She got to be ass naked in the booth. But yeah. So anyway, what was we talking about? Philly Blunt. Philly's Blunt. Yeah, that came and went. Everybody got pregnant. And then I became a solo artist. <laughs> but I wasn't a singer. I was a rapper. A rapper. Yeah. That's where the name Jaguar come from. I was in a, I was in a, um, after Philly's Blunt, I got into a group from Chester, Pennsylvania called the Zoo Click. And so everybody had animal name. But they all had like cool names and shit, Wolverine and Grizz and all. I'm like, I want an X-Man name. But they said, you want to be Jack? Jimmy looked at me. I was dating Jimmy at the time. I did a lot of dating when I was young. So I was dating Jimmy at the time. Jimmy Grizz from... Fat Cat, not from Fat Cat Click, from the Zoo Click. Everybody was a click back then. And um, Jimmy was like, Jag, if you gonna be in the group, your name is Jaguar. If your name ain't Jaguar, you can't be in the group. 
I was like, fuck it, I want to be in the group. I'll be this Jaguar bullshit. I felt like I was getting cheated. And being the geek that I am, I started studying the animal. And I started realizing how much I had in common with the animal. And then I started loving this animal. And I became that animal. I became Jaguar. I was the illest female MC on the streets of Philadelphia. I ghost wrote for Eve. I ghost wrote for Foxy Brown and she don't even know it. <laughs> Easiest thousand dollars I ever made. Fuck you, Inga. You ungrateful bitch. Frank Bank came to me and asked me ghost write for Eve before you died. And I did. I ghost wrote for a lot of people. You're welcome, Candy. And I'm talking about Candy Burris from Escape. Those early records that I wrote, those demos that I wrote down at Key Sweat Studio that your manager took and gave to y'all and had y'all front off like you actually fucking wrote them. Stole my records clean out from underneath me. I never got paid, Escape. But when, when the records made it a hit on the radio, it told me one thing, if they can steal your shit and, and it can make it on the radio, you can do your shit and it can make it on the radio. So y'all welcome for them ass cap awards and shit that you got for them early records. Y'all bitches know you didn't write. But I ain't hating. I'm happy for you. Bravo. There's still a... Yeah, there's a lot, trust me. No, because there's the whole in between that time after I had Giovanni and getting signed, there were the four years that I was a dominatrix and a pimp. Shout out to Real Street Stars, nigga. Moolah. Hey.